Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time. We bless your name for gathering us together so that you can restore us to the fullness of your blessing. And so that that fullness will spill over to the various congregations we come from. And they will do good, much, much good in the ministry you have appointed us to take care of. And we're praying, Lord, your hand will be upon every minister here. You'll touch every brother and every sister. And Lord, you'll wake us up and restore us to the fullness of your grace and your love and mercy in Jesus' name. We pray that what you did for people before us, you will do for every one of us. That will enjoy the outpouring of your love and your grace and your mercy. And Lord, whatever has happened in the past, we pray. In your great love, in your great mercy, you just forgive and overlook and get everyone back on their feet to minister as your originally purpose for every one of us. We pray, Lord, you make your children, your servants, men and women in this Congress. Make us firebrands to go out in your strength and in your power with the dynamite of heaven of the Holy Ghost in every heart. That, Lord, this work you have committed into our hands will prosper in our hands in Jesus' name. Bless those members of the choir that just minister to us now. We we'll pray, Lord, that you enrich their ministry too, not only at this Congress, but as they continue to minister in all our congregations, wherever they find themselves. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. We come to this session, a teaching session indeed, and we are looking at the Word of God on the passion and the power of a restored minister, a restored leader. It's a wonderful thing as you consider that when God calls a man, many things may happen between the time of that call and the time of the climax and the culmination of that call. And whatever may happen in between the beginning and the end, the Lord always has a way if we are yielded into the hands of the Lord to bring us back to the original purpose that the Lord had in mind. We're looking at a particular minister, a man of like passions like you and I. He responded to the call of the Lord just like you responded to the call of God. But somewhere along the line, something happened to him. And we thank the Lord because of his faithfulness. Because in faithfulness, these great champions of faith and these great giants in the ministry, instead of the Lord covering it up and just showing us the brighter part and the dynamic part of their ministry, the Lord has also shown us that there was a time when they were not as strong as it later became. There were times when they were not completely as solid, as stable, steadfast, and immovable as we saw them later. Sometimes when you read about the ministries of these great men, if you only read the other part, when they were reaping the fruit of success, and you can see the fire and the dynamism of the Holy Ghost in their ministry, you might almost give up and say, I'm not like that. I don't think I can be like that. But when the Lord shows you the past, and He shows you, let me use this language, the graph of their ministry, and He plots the graph at various points, and it traces their journey. It traces their ministry. It traces their pilgrimage from that time of the call. And it continues in the ministry until it comes to the climax. And then you see the variations, the ups and downs. The upper level and the lower level. The things that were done in their ministries. And the mistakes they made. 
the faults they had, the defeat they experienced, and the various things that happened to them, then you understand. Ah, look at that. What happened to him? That happened to me at that particular stage. And at that particular stage, and maybe at this very time now, you are even at that stage. But as you see, how the Lord brought them out of their valley, and he set their feet on the rock of ages, never to be moved again. Then you take courage, and you say, if the Lord can lift them up like that, the Lord can do the same thing for me. And wherever you are now, whether in the valley or even on the mountain top, the Lord will lift you up in Jesus' name. We're looking at the example and the illustration of the life of the Apostle Paul, of the Apostle Peter, the passion and the power of a restored leader. In Luke chapter 22, Luke chapter 22, I'm reading from verse 31 and verse 32. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. Lord, why will Satan want to have me? Why will Satan desire to have me? Oh, Peter. Satan wants workers. Satan wants ministers too. And Satan wants people that are dynamic. He needs them in every area of profession. And he sees there's something in you. And that you're going to do something definite, dynamic, effective, productive in the ministry. He wants to have you. But eventually, when he has you, if you are left in his hand, he's not going to use you and reward you. He'll use what you have, empty you out, and then throw you, throw you away like a tin of sardine, like the tin of milk. After you have taken the good thing inside, the can is thrown away as no use. And Satan has desired to have you, that he may sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you. Why would you do that? Because my hands are on you. My heart is on you. My eyes are on you. And my mind is there. I can see beyond the fall. And I can see beyond the instability. And I can see what I've chosen you for. And I'm not going to give up. I want to make something out of you. That is why I prayed for you. The Lord is praying for you. And no matter the wind that may blow in your life. And no matter the storm that may arise in your life. Might even be of your own making might even be of your own carelessness might even be of your own self-confidence all the same all the same even though you might have contributed to the wind and the storm blowing in your life the lord will not leave you in your problem it says i have prayed for peter and the lord is praying for you too that thy faith fail not wonderful a momentary fall is not a permanent fall if you are falling and your faith has failed momentarily at a moment of time don't take that as permanent and don't say it's gone i'm falling I give up. There's no use anymore. No. A momentary fall should not develop to a permanent fall. If you're on the ground, pick up yourself. There is a God in heaven that loves you. And there is a Christ in heaven. 
on, this, on the right hand side of the Father. He loves you. He wants to bring you up again. That your faith will not permanently fail. And when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. Well, that's about Peter. He had been one of the trusted disciples, one of the committed disciples, one of the intimate disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. In a moment of carelessness, self-confidence, prayerlessness, he sinned. And he denied his Lord. And he fell into the traps and into the hands of Satan, the devil, the adversary, the enemy, the accuser of the brethren. But he soon realized his fall. And he soon realized his backsliding. He remembered Christ's warning. He remembered Christ's prayer. He remembered Christ's promise. He remembered his own promise. What did I tell the Lord? What did I promise the Lord? How could I have yielded to something like this? He remembered his own promise and the Lord's promise. He remembered his own confidence, self-confidence, and the warning of Christ. Then he remembered the prayer of the Lord Jesus. I have prayed for you that your faith will not fail. Ah, that means then, judging from the statement, the utterance of the Lord Jesus Christ, that was going to be a temporary thing. Yes, I'm down, but rejoice not against me, my enemy. Although I'm down, I will get up. You will get up. And then the Lord looked at him, a tender look of Jesus, a tender look of love, a tender look of grace, a tender look of mercy, and he wept. I don't want you to concentrate too much on the fall of Peter. I want you to understand his response, his attitude. The Lord looked at him, the cock crew, and then he went out. And he wept. If we could have such a tender heart that just a look will be enough to settle it. That we will not need two hours message, five days retreat, one week congress. We will not need the ministration of many, many preachers and ministers. Just a look the look of christ just looking at him he just turned back and looked at him without a single word spoken and that single look what kind of tenderness what kind of softness what kind of humility what kind of sensitivity to the things of the spirit that that tender gracious, loving, merciful look to remind him could bring him back to his knees. And he went out, separated himself from all those other people in the wrong company. And then he wept tears of repentance. Lord, I blew it. Can I come back? Will I be received? All those revelations to showed me. How about them now? And the things you promise, how about those things now? And the kingdom, when you come back in your kingdom, how about that now? Have I lost everything? And then, what you have said, making me a fisher of men. I've not done anything. And this has happened. I sought love in your eyes when you looked at me. I saw tenderness. I didn't see final rejection, dejection. Peter, I'm looking at you. You've blown it. I have no use of you anymore. I'll pick somebody to replace you. I didn't see those things in your eyes. I saw in your eyes that you still have trust, confidence in me. 
you'll still make use of me. And then that helped him. He believed. And he was restored to the Lord. Restored to fellowship. And in a few days, restored to a fruitful ministry. And something encourages me in the life of Peter. He did not remain out of fellowship for weeks. For months. Sometimes you find somebody, a minister, and that minister has been doing some express for the Lord in a moment of carelessness and prayerlessness and self-confidence. That fellow falls, and then you are surprised they remain there. Weeks go by, months go by, years go by. It shouldn't be like that. Immediately, Peter came back. And if there is any backslider here, you will come back. You will come back to the Lord. You will come back to your ministry. Nobody is going to do your work for you. You cannot do mine for me. I cannot do your work for you. There is an appointed ministry for you. There is an appointed ministry for everyone. And nobody will take your place. And nobody will take your job. And nobody will take your crown. And nobody will take your reward. Come back and see. See what happened to Peter. And see how he came back. And see what God made of him. He became remarkable. In passion and in power. In Mark chapter 14. Mark chapter 14. I'm reading in verse 72. And the second time, the cock crew, and Peter called to mind the words that Jesus said unto him. Before the cock crew twice, thou shalt deny me thrice. And when he thought thereon, and there was a moment of thinking, a moment of, a moment of meditation. When he thought about it, he wept. Chapter 16 of Mark, verse 6. And when he says unto and he says unto them, Be not affrighted. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, which was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. Behold the place where he was laid. But go your way and tell his disciples. Do you know his disciples? Go and tell his disciples. Do you know all his disciples? Aha. Uh -huh. Peter is one of them. And uh, Peter. Angel, how do you know that Peter is now fully, completely restored? Ah, we were all watching. When Peter denied the Lord. And we were all sorrowful in heaven. And we were joyful as Peter repented in tears. We knew it. Whenever anybody returns to the Lord, anybody repents of sin, there is joy in heaven among the angels of God. And when a champion, when a person that is a pillar in the church when that fellow has fallen and when that fellow comes back to the lord the joy we have in a, a ordinary sinner the the sinner on the road the sinner on the street the joy we have when they repent that's great but the joy we have the happiness we have, the, the excitement we have. When a champion in the faith, a pillar in the church, when that pillar or champion, when he returns to the Lord, our joy knows no bound. We knew when Peter came back, that's why I'm sending you to his disciples. Go and tell his disciples and Peter that he goes before you into Galilee. And there shall you see him as he said unto you. Well, he became a firebrand. And you know, if the one that fell and came back again became a firebrand, those of you, those of us that have not fallen, you become real, real firebrand. And the Lord will do great things through you and through your ministry in Jesus' name. 
We're considering the message in three parts. Number one, the prayer and the path to restoration. Going away from the Lord, you take a path. And there are some milestones on the road of going back, the downward trend. When you go from Jerusalem to Jericho, yes, there are milestones there. When you go from Zion and you go to Babylon, there is a path that you take. And if you're going to retrace your journey from Babylon up back to Zion, there's a place, there's a road, there's a path you take. And when you are coming from Egypt and you are coming back to Jerusalem, the city of the great king, there is a path that you take. When you are being in the very lap of the devil, in the very hands of the devil, in the very embrace of the devil, in the dungeon of darkness, and you are coming to the very good embrace and fellowship and love of the Savior in the bright light, indescribable light, you are coming from darkness to light, there is also a path that you take, the prayer and the path to restoration. Point number two, the passion and the pursuit after restoration. After you are restored, after Peter was restored, after a backsliding minister is restored, after a backsliding champion of the faith is restored, the passion and the pursuit that comes, that you see, demonstrated in the life of that person that is restored. Number three, the progress and the perseverance after rest restoration. Come to number one. The prayer and the pass to restoration. In Luke chapter, in Matthew chapter 26. Matthew chapter 26. I'm reading from verse 75. And Peter remembered the word of Jesus. Can I just throw this in here to help you and to help myself? Storing the word of God. Whatever happens, a spiritual accident on the way that gets the standing minister down. And now your back is against the wall. And while the enemy might be laughing, saying, uh -huh, I got him, I got him. He was too confident. He was overconfident. And was tearing the kingdom of the devil like nobody's business. Now I got him. The thing that will help you, should in case anything like this ever happened, is remembering the words of Jesus. Remembering the words of love. And the words of grace. And the words of faith. And the words of promise. Remembering the words of Jesus. This is the scene that helped Peter. Peter remembered the word of Jesus, which said unto him, Before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice. And he went out on the basis of remembering those words of Jesus. And then we are told, and wept bitterly. What does that mean? He wept bitterly. Look at this. In 2 Corinthians chapter 7. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, looking at it in verse 10. For godly sorrow walketh repentance to salvation. Godly sorrow, the mourning that came as a result of remembering the words of Jesus. Why did I do that? Why did I say I didn't know the Lord? Why did I deny? What was the matter with me? And Jesus warned me seriously enough. How could I have done that? He remembered the words of Jesus. And that brought to him godly sorrow. And the godly sorrow worked repentance to salvation. Not to be regretted of, not to be repented of. But the sorrow of the world walketh death. It's just like... The case of David that we've read about quite a number of times. Look at this. In Psalm 51. Psalm 51. 
again here it was the remembrance of what the Lord had done for David because God told David through Nathan David what have you done I give you this I give you this I give you that I blessed you this way, I blessed you this way, I blessed you that way. And all the same, you, you've gone so far as to commit sin with this woman. And you have killed Uriah, the husband, with the sword of the enemy. Ah, look at what will happen as judgment. And David said, Nathan, I'm king. I'm your leader. I'm the ruler over you. But you are the prophet of God. At this time now, I cannot talk about my kingly royal position and royal authority. I must confess before you. And I'm confessing to God, I have sinned. And God said, tell him, the sins are forgiven. How wonderful God is. How loving, merciful the Lord is. Here is a prayer that he prayed. Have mercy upon me, O God. Psalm 51 verse 1. According to the, the loving kindness, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity. Cleanse me from my sin. I acknowledge my transgressions. My sin is ever before me against thee thee only have I sin and done this evil in thy sight that, that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest and be clear when thou judgest behold I was shapen in iniquity in sin did my mother conceive me anything good in me Lord you know even from the time of birth the Adamic nature was there even from the time of birth, the original sin was there. Within and without, I'm all muddled up. I'm confused. I'm, I'm corruption. Within and without, I'm just a bundle of corruption. And that's the way I was born. Even the time I was conceived, this man really went low. This man really confessed. This man really gave himself fully to the Lord. He said, Lord, everything is bad. Beyond what Nathan can speak about, Nathan is just talking about an act of sin that I committed. But I'm confessing to you, Lord, that within and without, everything within me, my blood system, my thought, my heart, my mind, even my original nature, my culture, my tradition, everything is all sin. Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part thou shalt make me to know wisdom. Purge me. I'm trusting you. That you can take the vilest sinner. You, you can take the most miserable backslider. And you can restore him. You can reform him. You can refine him. You can purge him. And make something new out of him. Purge me with his soap and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness. That the bones with thou hast broken may rejoice. Hide thy face from my sins and blot out all mine iniquities. You know, Lord, Nathan is just talking about one sin that I committed. But the remembrance of that one sin that is made public now makes me to know that there are some other things that I've done. And I'm now talking about all my iniquities in the plural. Create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence. Take not thy Holy Spirit from me. What could I be without the Holy Ghost in me? Lord, I remember my history. Before I came to Samuel, and Samuel poured that oil on me, and then the Holy Ghost came within me and came upon me. I know my history before that time. I was like nothing. I was like a nobody. Nobody knew me. It was the outpouring of that oil that brought the Holy Ghost into my life. That's when, after that, I played I had learned that uh, musical instrument before the Holy Ghost ever came upon me. And that uh, musical instrument never did anything good. It was after the Holy Ghost came upon me in 1 Samuel chapter 16 that I then played and Saul was delivered. 
And then in chapter 17, that's how the uh, that's how Goliath was gotten rid of. It's because of your Holy Spirit in my life. Now I'm backsliding. Now I'm gone. Now I'm down. Now I am on the floor. The Lord, you must do something here for me now. Take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. I, I know the joy I used to have in the night I will wake up like this and the joy of the Lord coming from a fountain deep within my very being will come out like this and I burst into singing. The joy of salvation, I know what it looks like. Sometimes I am in, I'm on my throne and I'm trying to judge one case or the other and things look bad and I'm thinking is our country like this? Is my nation like this? All of a sudden that from the fountain, from the very depth of my heart the joy of the lord will come out but since i committed that sin lord you know the joy i've not been singing and since i committed that sin i've been so bowed down i've been very very heavy and i've been very very sorrowful and even when i try to smile and when i try to be joyful everything is artificial i'm asking for it now the joy of thy salvation Bring it back to me again and restore and uphold me with thy free spirit. The prayer for restoration. And then with that prayer for restoration, there is a path that leads to restoration. I want you to see, you know, as uh, if somebody has backsliding. If you have not been there before, I pray you will never be there. But if you've been there before, you understand the road back to the redeemer's bosom sometimes the road is short but many many times the road to the redeemer's heart to the redeemer's bosom after somebody has backsliding seems longer and rough the heart is confused the accuser's voice is deafening prayer is weak the cry for mercy is feeble Shame and self-deception create roadblocks to God's mercy. Fear and unbelief shut out the ray of light and the ray of hope. Eventually, God's mercy breaks through. And the pool and the force of God's love breaks through. And the falling giant is awakened. And he said, I will not remain here. Satan, you will not have a permanent hold on me. I'm going back to where I came from. I am going back to the Lord. And then he takes quick steps. And with those quick steps, eventually he comes back home. And he comes into an, in the embrace of the Father, of the Redeemer, and of the Savior. What steps will he take? That will mark his path from the dungeon and from the valley of sin, of shame, of degradation. And then get him back into the very arms and embrace of the Lord. One, realization. Two, repentance. Three, renunciation. Four, restitution. Five, restoration. Six, resignation. Seven, recommissioning. Number one, there is a realization. And as we check up in, in the Bible, in the case of Peter, when his eyes met the eyes of the Lord, there was a realization. That's what the Lord spoke about. I wasn't careful enough. Now I'm falling. I realize. That's what brought the tears of repentance. Number two, repentance. I'm going back to where I came from. It was better for me when I was with the Lord. I had peace of mind. I had contentment. I had the joy of the Lord. I had hope for the future. And I had within me the confidence in the Lord. I was very much expectant of the coming of the Lord. But now, the situation I find myself now, uh -uh, I cannot remain in this situation. There is repentance. Number three, there is renunciation. You see, the backslider gets a lot of things and acquires a lot of things. And gets involved with a lot of things in the backsliding position. 
But now, there is the renunciation. I reject the works of the devil. I reject all the offer from the messengers of Satan. I reject, I renounce all the works of darkness. And then restitution. If you have, during that backsliding position, you stole. You restored the money that you stole. Or you committed sin, immorality, you were faithful. And your wife did not know you were unfaithful. But you were faithful. And every time that woman looks nice and serves you and does everything, you're having guilt that look at this woman. She's so gentle and so nice and so committed and so loving and so faithful. If this woman knew that, you know, I'm just a non-entity, an empty fellow, I'm just like a worthless fellow. And this woman is just doing her best to serve me, but I'm ashamed to even look at her. She's so clean and she's so holy and she's so righteous and she's so, so faithful and she's so dutiful and she's so considerate and, and, and she's so Christianly. And look at me and she doesn't know that I'm just an empty-headed, empty-hearted hypocrite. But the time that these, you're coming back in the path of restoration, you have to call this dear sister. And you have to say, I'm sorry I've hurt you, but whatever I tell you now, whether you know it or not, I've been unfaithful. And then you are able to make your way right. There is restitution. Or it may be restitution in other ways. That you have broken some laws, the law of the country. You've broken the law. It may be something related to the ministry. That uh, the Lord has appointed you. And we thought you were faithful. Everybody thought you were faithful. But my brother, my sister, if we do not make that correction, if we do not make that uh, restitution, you know what? You'll just be carrying the heavy load and the condemnation. You'll be dragging yourself. Why don't you just do it once and for all? And then you're free. You're set free. You'll be at liberty. You'll be able to minister without anything, any hang up at the back of your mind. And then there is restoration. You come to hold on to the mercy of the Lord. You said, Lord, you told me you are praying for me. You told me that my faith will not fail permanently. You told me that the calling of God is without repentance. You told me I will not be a material in the hand of the devil to be used of the devil. I've handed my life over to you. Get me back and the Lord will get you back. And then resignation. Resignation just means, now this doesn't mean resignation, that the resignation that many of you know. The resignation that I resign. I'm not working for God anymore. In fact, that one, I'm still searching the scripture when you find uh, a case of resignation in that sense. Come and show me. When God called Moses, yes, it was tough. Could he resign? No, sir. And the thing that looks near resignation is uh, when he said, Lord, have I made all these people kill me? I can't resign. I'm in it already. What can I do? I cannot come out of this. Have I given back to these people? My life is almost going. The pressure from them is too much. I cannot resign. The only thing I can do is to leave the world. You cannot leave the ministry. The only thing you can do is to leave the world. Joshua. As they overcame in Jericho. And then they were to go to Ai. Then the people, they, they defeated them. 36 of them, they were killed. Joshua, what are you going to do? Can you resign? How can I resign? I mean, this thing forever. And there is, uh, there, is a, there is a dispensation upon me. And one to me, except I do it. But all I can do is fall before my, on my face before the Lord and say, Lord, what are we going to do? All these Canaanites were here that were being defeated. They'll be, they'll be after us. And God said, get up. They're seen in the camp. Deal with that. I will still be with you. David, you have seen. Uh-huh, yes. And these judgments are coming upon you. yes. Can you resign and say, well, Nathan, since you said, the discipline is now on me. This will happen. This will happen. If that is, if it's so serious like that, because I am a king, am I the only sinner in Israel? 
I've not told other people backsliding. You are telling me, this will happen, this will happen, this will happen. All right, I know what to do. I resign. David, you cannot resign. This one is different. And then you come to the New Testament, whether it's Paul the Apostle, or it's John the Beloved, or Peter. You don't find that kind of resignation. There was no way they could resign. You are in it, you are in it. Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And you know, many people that do not study their Bible, they don't read their Bibles, whenever they have a little difficulty and a little confusion and a little depression or whatever it is, then they say, I resign. It's not in the Bible. That's in the farm, in the corporation, outside. That's in your marketplace outside. But you know, the resignation we're talking about here is, Lord, I resign to your will. Thy will be done. If this is what you have for me, the way you want to use my life for the rest of my life, I backslid. You have taken me back. You have shown me mercy. You have shown me love. You have revealed your grace to me. What can I do again? All my life, my future, everything that I can ever be, I surrender, I abandon, I yield everything unto you. I resign my will completely unto you. That's what you do when you are coming back fully unto the Lord. And then, number seven, there is a recommissioning. A recommissioning. And that's what the Lord is telling us, that as you have seen, what has happened? You look at Revelation chapter 2, Revelation chapter 2, verses 4 and 5. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Remember therefore from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and remove thy candlestick, from its place, out of its place, except thou repent. I pray God will not remove your candlestick. You will not wait until the God of patience, God who is long suffering, you will not wait until his long suffering runs out. And think about it. Look up, brothers and sisters. As you see the long suffering of God, as you see the patience of God, if God eventually removes the candlestick of anybody that fellow must have been so terrible that he could exhaust the long suffering of a god that is almost infinitely patient you will not exhaust that long suffering the lord will get your back and the lord will make use of you and before you get to that point where God said, all right, it's over. You'll come in before that time. I come to point number two, the passion and the pursuit after res restoration. The passion and the pursuit after restoration. And we were studying about Peter in particular, and they were making the general application to ourselves. You look at 2 Corinthians in chapter 7. 2 Corinthians chapter 7. And you're looking at uh, verse 11. We read verse 10 before in the first point. We were talking about the sorrow, the repentance that's acceptable in the sight of God. In verse 11. For behold, this self, same thing. How ye sorrowed after a godly sort. What carefulness it wrought in you. Ye, what clearing of yourselves, ye, what indignation, ye, what fear, ye, what vehement desire, ye, what zeal, what revenge, in all things, ye have approved yourselves to be clear in this matter. And Paul the Apostle was writing to the Corinthians and he said, I've seen the evidence of your repentance, I've seen the evidence of your realization. And this is what we ought to see. And this is what you should be looking for in your own personal life. It says, uh, I have seen this. You sorrowed after a godly sort. Uh, what that means is this. After you realize what you have done. And then you are not moving about in the public. You will not be carrying an air of pride. Maybe other people have heard about what happened to you and what you did 
And then you still want to, you know, like Saul, honor me before the people. And then you're walking about, and you're walking with raised shoulders, looking down on everybody, being on the defensive. Maybe they have heard. And maybe they are going to challenge me. And before they challenge me, let me kind of carry a bold face, a thick skin, and a fiery look. And look around and see if there anybody talk to me to remind me of that thing that happened before. And I'll get at you. And I will ask you whether you yourself, you have been an angel. Ah, not that kind of attitude. But these people, they sorrowed after a godly sort. Now it says what carefulness they trust in you. They were not very careful. And any challenge coming, they remember, Lord, I'm not strong, I am weak. And only in you am I strong. Help me. The self-confidence of the past will no more be there. What clearing of yourself, what indignation. It's like they're angry against the devil. And they want to revenge against the devil. And they have a vehement desire now. All the time I missed out that I didn't serve the Lord, I'm going to double up my strength and my energy and my fire and my zeal and my vehement desire. And I'm going to do something. What zeal it wrought in you? What revenge? Like revenging on the devil, tearing down his kingdom. Because you made me do that. And I'm one of the leading apostles. And I'm one of the leading people among the, among the followers of Jesus. Now, I'm going to revenge on the devil. I'm going to tear down his kingdom. And I don't care whether they'll throw me into prison in Jerusalem. I don't care what Herod is going to plan. This one, I am going to do something now that the devil will know. He got me for one day. He got me for one week. For the rest of my life, I'm going to tear down the kingdom of the devil. You will tear down the kingdom of the devil. You see, and that's what he's saying here, and that's what he does for us. After the Lord Himself has restored us, the restored minister, the recommissioned minister, is more humble, is more prayerful, is more compassionate, is more fervent in love, is more patient in suffering, is more watchful, is more dependent upon the Lord, and. He is more zealous in the service of the Lord. Now that he has been restored, he has come back, he resists Satan more steadfastly. And is eager to regain lost time to be spent for the master with vehement desire, with holy indignation, with sacred revenge against Satan. He moves with bold faith to pull down the kingdom of the devil and to pull the lost and the backsliding souls away from sin and degradation. Once restored in the life of Peter, there was no more lukewarmness. There was no more disobedience. But now what we see? We see passion. We see power. We see faith. We see great grace. We see boldness. And we see relentless service. That's what it ought to be. And that's the thing that we ought to see in our lives after we come back to the Lord from the wrong journey we have taken out of the fold of the Lord. In John chapter 21, John chapter 21, verse 15. In John chapter 21, verse 15, so when they are dying, Jesus says, to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? Of course I do. Now that I've come back, what else could I do? I love you now. And I love you more than anyone, more than anything, more than all of them combined together. He says unto him, Yes, Lord, yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He says unto him, Feed my lambs. And he said to him, again the second time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? He saith unto him, Yes, Lord, but you know, thou knowest that I love thee. And he says unto him, Feed my sheep. He says unto him, The third time, Lord, why are you asking him the third time? Just to make him repeat what he had said. Repetition makes for emphasis. 
when he repeats this, he will never forget again. He's giving me promise. He's giving me his life. He's giving me his time. He's giving me everything that he has got. And I want him to repeat that. I want him to say that until it becomes part of him. I want him to repeat those words of commitment, those words of consecration. I want him to hear all over again my own words of confirmation so that anything he meets on the road, anytime he's in the ministry, whatever he comes across, he will remember his own word of promise. He will remember my own word of confirmation. That's why I'm making him to say it all over again. And then we're told, Simon, lovest thou me? Simon, then Peter was grieved because he said unto him the third time, lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things. Thou knowest that I love thee. And Jesus says unto him, feed my sheep. But you see, when the Lord has brought you back like that, whatever now happens, you are really going to serve the Lord. And you will serve the Lord. And we will hear good stories about you. We will hear testimonies about you. That now, with new zeal, with new power, with new ardor, you are serving the Lord and you are giving your very best unto the Lord. It will happen in Jesus' name. And you see how he repeated many, many times, Lord, I love you. Lord, I love you. What was he saying? Let me use Old Testament language in Psalm 73. Psalm 73. And let's see what he was saying. And let's see the words the Lord himself is putting in our mouth. And he's saying, this is how you ought to do it. This is how I have to do it. Now that we have come back, Psalm 73. Reading from verse 22. So foolish was I and ignorant. If you backslid, what, uh, what, what else can we describe that? That is foolishness. How foolish I was. And I was ignorant. I, I was as a great, as a beast before thee. Nevertheless, I'm continually with thee. And thou hast holding me by thy right hand. Thou shalt guide me with thy counsel. Afterward, receive me to glory. Now, verse 25. Whom have I in heaven but thee? My mind is not in the world anymore. My mind is not with all those uh, deceivers anymore. I'm not going to be um, by the fire with all the people that do not know the Lord anymore. Look at this. Whom have I in heaven but thee? And there is none upon earth that I desire beside thee. That means now he was fully yielded and given unto the Lord. And I pray that that same fervency and that same fire and that same zeal and that same consecration and that same commitment will come into every one of us in Jesus' name. Point number three, the progress and the perseverance after restoration. Progress and the perseverance after restoration. You know the story yourself. You don't need to, for me to read all this to you. In chapter, two, in chapter 1 of Acts of the Apostles, didn't you see Peter's name there? And before you finish reading chapter 2, don't you come across Peter? And as you come to chapter 3 of Acts of the Apostles, what's the, who is the central figure proclaiming the name of Christ? Doing miracles through the name of Jesus Christ. The central person there is Peter, the apostle. And when you come to chapter 4, the people that preach, was Peter there? Yes, he was there. And the people that had great grace and boldness, and they declared the word of God without any restriction or interruption. Who do you find there, Peter? And when you come to Acts of the Apostles, chapter 5, what do you find there? As Peter was walking by the side of the road, whose shadow was healing the sick, that's Peter. And then as we come to chapter 6, who are the people that said, we will give ourselves to the ministry of the word and to prayer. Isn't it Peter? And as we come to chapter 8 and when they had received the word of God in Samaria, who are the people they sent to Samaria? When those Samaritans received the word of God, Peter and John, when Dorcas died in chapter 9, who were the people, who was the person that raised Dorcas up? That's Peter. And when God wanted to take the gospel to Cornelius house who was the instrument picked up by the Lord that was used to bring the gospel to the Gentiles that is Peter you see when you have come back to the Lord and you are restored to the Lord there is 
progress and there is perseverance in ministry after that restoration. I pray the Lord will do something like that for you in Jesus' name. Restored and renewed. Holy fire was rekindled in the heart of Peter. And he persevered to the end in a dynamic ministry for his Lord, his life, and uninterrupted ministry after, it, after restoration revealed six things. Number one, power in ministration. Power in ministration. In Acts of the Apostles chapter 2, reading there in verse 14. Acts chapter 2, reading in verse 14. Here we are told in verse 14, But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judea and all that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you, and hearken to my words. By the time he finished, rounded up his message, you know what happened in verse 37. Now when they had this, they were preached in their heart. And they said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? And the result of that is in verse 41. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized. And the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. Number one, power in ministration. And do you know when it was in Acts chapter 10? In the house of Cornelius, he was still speaking like this. And Holy Ghost power, Holy Ghost baptism came upon the people that heard. Number two, progress in miracle ministry progress in miracle ministry if you trace the ministry of, of peter after he had the holy ghost after his restoration you'll find in chapter 3 of acts healing but that one by direct ministration save and go divine on what i have i give unto you rise up and walk by the time you come to chapter 5 yes it's still healing and deliverance from evil spirits, from those that were tormented by this time now, not direct administration, a shadow coming upon them, and then they were being healed, they were being delivered. By the time you come to chapter 9 of Acts of the Apostles, it's not just healing, it's not just deliverance, it's raising the dead. Progress in miracle ministry. Number three, the pattern of modesty and meekness. Pattern modesty and meekness you come to acts of the apostles chapter 11 in chapter 10 he had gone to the house of cornelius those who were gentiles and then when he came back to jerusalem they challenged him simon come on here what did we say what did we hear that you did you went to the gentiles and you ate with them and now before his fall when he was self-confident what do you think he would have done? What do you think he would have questioned them? Who are you? Talking to me like that. I, what are you asking me? That I went to the house of Cornelius? What do you know? What revelation do you have? What vision do you have? By the way, who are you to challenge the greatest of the apostles? That's what he would have said. But now, it became a pattern of modesty and meekness and he said brethren i was in my house and i was hungry and then something was showed to me and i heard the voice of the lord saying rise up and eat and just like you are telling me now i told the lord i said no nothing unclean ever entered my mouth and then the lord said what he had cleansed i should not call common unclean and while I was thinking about it, there were three people waiting at the door. And the Spirit of God bade me go with them. Brethren, that's why I went. And when I got there, really I didn't even plan to do too much. I was just speaking the word of God. While I was still speaking, the Holy Ghost came upon them as on us at the beginning. And now, who was I? That after the Holy Ghost came upon them, I had to baptize them in water. They said, then we understand. That's according to what the Lord had said. That the time is coming. He'll pick out some people for his name. It became a pattern of modesty and meekness. Number four, perseverance in ministry. Perseverance in ministry. He was thrown into jail, but he persevered. 
he was incarcerated but he continued you see after his resurrection you see what came the perseverance that came to him in ministry Acts chapter 4 Acts chapter 5 reading from verse 17 then the high priest rose up and all they that were with him which is a sect of the Sadducees and were filled with indignation and laid their hands on the apostles and put them in the common prison but the angel of the Lord by night opened the door the prison doors and brought them forth and said go stand and speak in the in the temple to the people all the words of this life and they came out of the prison and they came to do uh, the work of the Lord verse 27 and when they had brought them they set them before the council and the high priest asked saying did not we strictly command you that you should not teach in this name behold ye have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine and intend to bring this man's blood upon us then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to be God rather than men. Perseverance in ministry. Number five, preservation of the master's message. Preservation of the master's message. That was his concern. Now. The only thing that concerned him, not his safety, not his security, not his life, not a life of ease. All that concerned him now after his restoration was just this preservation of the master's message in Second Peter chapter 3. Reading from verse 1, this second epistle, Beloved, I now write unto you, in both which I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance, that ye might be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets, and of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior, knowing this false, that there shall come in the last days coffers, walking in their walking after their own laws. In verse 17, ye therefore beloved, seeing ye know these things before, beware, lest ye also being led away with the error of the wicked fall from your own steadfastness. He said, be steadfast, be stable. Remain in the word because my concern now after I've been restored is that I will preserve the master's message. Number six, preparedness for martyrdom. Preparedness for martyrdom. And the Lord had told him in John chapter 21 verses 18 and 19. John chapter 21 reading from verse 18 and from verse 19. Here the Lord Jesus spoke to Peter and he says, Verily I say unto thee, When thou wast young, thou guarded thyself, and walkest whither thou wouldest. But when thou shalt be old, thou shalt stretch forth thy hands, and another shall gird thee, and carry thee whither thou wouldest not. This speak he signifying what death he should glorify God. And when he had spoken thus, he says unto him, Follow me. And he followed. They were told in Second Peter chapter 1. Second Peter chapter 1, reading from verse 12, here Peter said, Wherefore I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, though ye, ye know them, and be established in the present truth. Yea, I think it meet, as long as I'm in this tabernacle, to stir up your, to stir up by putting you in remembrance, knowing that shortly I must put up this my tabernacle, even as our Lord Jesus Christ has showed me. Moreover, I will endeavor that ye may be able, after my disease, after my departure, after my death, to have these things always in remembrance. He was prepared for martyrdom. Think about this now, brothers and sisters, that this uh, Peter was restored back to the love of God and into the ministry and the grace of God was abundant in his life and this same grace is available today this same love is available today and the Lord is saying as 
he is stretching out a hand of love and the hand of mercy and the hand of grace to every one of us even if you have not been born in you are a real devoted child of God thank God for you but all the same the grace of God abundant grace has been offered to you you will still stretch out your hand of love and your hand of mercy and your hand of faith and you say yes I grab that I receive that that's for me and if you have fallen if you have gone away from the Lord what a glorious opportunity between you and the Lord we don't need to make any public a show out of that we don't need to make any form fear out of that we don't need to parade you before the people and say see this person is coming to the Lord he was backslid all that is not necessary between you and the Lord right there where you are standing right there where you are sitting you can say yes I hear of your love. I hear of your mercy. I hear of your grace. I hear of your tenderness. I hear of your compassion. And I remember somebody like me, Peter, if I was bragging and I see that I was just like that man. And he fell and I know I've fallen. But now I am coming back home. And the Lord will receive you. I said the Lord will receive you. And you know, the Lord will put fire into your bones. Will put zeal in your heart. And as you come back, you will not be less in ministry. You'll be greater in ministry. You'll not be less in commitment. You'll be greater in commitment. We'll hear power in your life. Progress in your ministry. You'll become a pattern to other believers. You will persevere unto the end. And you, you'll be an instrument in the hand of God to preserve the truth of the word of God. And whatever God has for you in this life, in ministry, until you hear the final word, welcome home, well done, come into your reward, you will be prepared for whatever will come. The Lord is on your side. Whatever has happened, whatever water went under the bridge, the Lord is saying, forget about it. Come, I will receive you. Rise up and let us pray. Let's offer ourselves to the Lord. Give ourselves to the Lord. The Lord is merciful. The love of God is available for you. Please come. The mercy of God is available. Please come. The joy of the Lord is waiting for you. Please come. A renewed strength in ministry is available. Please come.